Great. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, first of all, thanks very much, Lewis, for joining us. You've magically uh, changed into another room um, for the reasons that I know. It's great. Thank you so much for that talk. That was really masterful and really picked up a lot of the issues that we want to get into. First of all, I want to introduce, and you can see the pictures there looking very uh, senior and very important, my co um, panelists uh, that you'll see from the program. Um, and I think it's really important. We have a nice mix with Edith from, uh, from Nigeria and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and, and the University of Jos, and also our colleagues who are uh, from Egypt. So first of all, I want to open it up to any questions for Lewis. Uh, we have a bit more time um, because um, we haven't uh, really got much in the way of other discussions. But personally for me, for end-stage liver disease, I think this is much the most important topic. I don't really think that talking about the magic unicorn of transplantation um, and uh, other issues um, are relevant. So Lewis, can I ask you a question first while some of my colleagues um, are, are getting themselves uh, unmuted and ready? Why do you think that the African epidemic of HCC is not being recognized in any of the guidelines to date? So I sit very much with you in the frustrations of not having any real sophistication of the understanding of HCC in African patients that are reflected in either the global or any other guidelines. Thanks, Caution, um, and, and thanks so much for to the other um, co-discussants um, in this group, and uh, really for the to the entire um, Calder organization for organizing this meeting. Um, I think one of the challenges is the lack of data. And I think it's really important for us as a community to um, work together to um, ensure that there is increased awareness at, on a global scale of the impact of, of this disease in Africa. Um, it, you know, I think our experience has been as we've had conversations with um, ministries of health, with policymakers, uh, with international organizations that are focused on, on healthcare in terms of the global burdens of disease, that this is really just one of the hidden um, epidemics um, in, in many of our countries. Um, patients are diagnosed quietly, often in rural areas, um, they present um, without, you know, without a lot of, in a, in a sense, fanfare. They are too sick often at the time they, pre they present to, to form anything like an advocacy group of, 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 of substance, and they die quietly and very quickly. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. I'm going to keep things going along because we have actually yeah. quite a lot of... Um, um, comments and questions coming in now that I've finally figured out how to get that working. So before I go to that, can I welcome Edith um, to the panelists and really, really value what's your perspective of what you just heard in the last 25 minutes? Uh, how does it feel on the ground? How does it feel for you? This is your area of expertise. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much the same, actually, you know, because when you talk about um, the, the late onset, that presentation of patients is so late. It, uh, most of the patients that we see, nothing can be done by the time they present. And then we put this together. In fact, the um, mortality in, in, in my area of, of Nigeria, where I, I, I work, is two and a half months, not even up to the four months, three months that is a mortality between the time of mortality be between diagnosis and death. So pretty much patients just present just before they die. So it, the situation is really there, but with a lot of education that has been going on in the community and all and everywhere, you know, the uh, Society for Gastroenterology and Hepatology in Nigeria and in, in with the government has really are working together to really spread the message so that people come in so that we do a lot of screening. The hope is that in future patients will start coming early, but that's the same thing. 
And I think the story is the same pretty much all of Africa. I mean, sub-Saharan Africa. That's it. Okay, thank you. Can I bring in and welcome Professor uh, Ashraf uh, from Cairo University, who's another expert in HCC, where we are overwhelmed with the expertise. Um, I'm the one dropping the expertise for the team here. What's your perspective from that data you've heard? Is this, is this reflective of your practice? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kush. And I'm really welcome Professor Lewis and Professor Dr. Kiki. Uh, it's my pleasure to join this, and it was a, a, an outstanding presentation from Dr. Lewis. And uh, uh, thank you. Uh, it was my my question. Your question, Dr. Kosh, is was my question to Professor Dr. Lewis. The, the need of uh, protocols and guidelines for treatment and management of liver cancer in Africa. Uh, this is uh, it's, liver cancer is a major problem in Africa. And uh, we had some conversation with Dr. Lewis in Boston a few months ago about the need of, we, uh, the need of uh, an African guidelines. And the problem, as he said, the, the lack of meta-analysis and the lack of data. Uh, so uh, the, the problem in our uh, uh, African continent is we need more and more, encourage more and more uh, uh, research in the field of liver cancer, in the field of diagnosis, in the field of early detection and treatment. And we have in our country uh, um, really uh, a good example in approaching uh, the problem of liver cancer, the availability of different kinds of, of treatment options, and uh, treat the major risk factors of liver cancer. As Dr. Lewis said, hepatitis C virus is uh, that was the major risk factor of hepatosarcastoma in our country. And by now, it, it was a, in a, a past problem. Uh, we now, by now, we, we could implement a program of mass treatment. And next, we implemented a program for screening every person in Egypt of having hepatitis C virus, providing the treatment for free. So by now, we don't have that problem again. And of course, it considered to be a primary prevention of liver cancer. I think it's a, just an example of how we can approach a problem that such uh, in, uh, in uh, such a uh, case in, in Egypt, a major problem like hepatitis C virus, a major problem, or a major risk factor for hepatitis C carcinoma. So we, it's just an example for how we can approach this. So- Great. So I'm going to cover across because actually we have a lot of questions coming through. So it's really precipitated a lot of discussion. I'm really glad and, and I thank all my colleagues on the Calder Organizing Committee that we have given time. Uh, and, and this is really focused on HCC, I think, in the majority. So quick questions from me and then reflecting some of the uh, questions that I'm seeing on the chat. And thank you all for those questions. Please keep them coming. So number one, um, Professor Ashraf, do you see... Uh, in your HCC practice, what do you feel your uh, median survival is now uh, with your Egyptian patients? Is it, is it improving? Do you have access to all therapies? Is diagnosis uh, by and large happening before the presentation of HCC? Can you just give me a minute on that before we move on? Yes. Uh, in, in the last few years, we have implemented the multidisciplinary approach for hepatocytic carcinoma. And this, of course, has a positive impact on the early diagnosis and the treatment of pet carcinoma. We have tertiary centers along Egypt, and through these centers, we can see patients with liver cancer, and we provide most of the, uh, uh, the management options for pet carcinoma are by now available in our country, even for liver transplantation, resection, uh, percutaneous ablation, and all other options are available. Uh, so this has uh, implemented, uh, has a, a positive impact on the uh, survival, the overall survival, of course, of liver cancer. However, the problem is we need some education uh, for the patients to, for, for early, for, uh, yes, for uh, approaching the, uh, the, the clinician for a regular follow-up for every patient having chronic liver disease. This is what we need in, in our country. 
because uh, uh, most of our cases, unfortunately, uh, coming in the intermediate stage, uh, maybe with part, part of invasion. However, all options like tear, transarterial radioembolization uh, is also available. Even, yes, even the, the immune, the, the new immune uh, uh, um, therapy now is by now available. However, it's very expensive and I think it will need a lot of time to be implemented in our country. Great. Let me come to Edith and then I'm going to come back to Lewis because there are some questions from your presentation. Um, you're very chatty, Professor Ashraf. We have a lot of questions coming through. So this is lovely. It's, I want to keep this interactive. So Edith, what availability of therapies do you have or is it really um, a moot question because of the late presentation and the lack of diagnosis in these patients when they come to you? Yes. Honestly, we do not have any of uh, those, those things. Let's see. Uh, when it comes to resection, maybe two or three hospitals in the country can offer that. Um, for ablation, taste, and all the others, we really do not have it. And majority of our patients come in late anyway. Now, so the patients that come in, so all we, we, we are really able to do is to, uh, given the uh, chemotherapy, so Raphinib is available. But I, I just listened to uh, Professor Arab saying that the, the country, that they, they are treated free. 95% or 98% of our patients pay for their drugs. So, and then unfortunately, most of the patients are the poor ones. So they are unable to afford these drugs. So patients pay for the drugs. So most of our patients, all we do is just give them strafinib and then the palliative care. So that is all mm -hmm. we are able to offer. Okay, I mean, th thank you very much. I'm gonna come back to Lewis here because he's being very patient. So number one, some questions from your talk. Uh, and really, I guess we're saying as a group for the, for the rest of the colder uh, kind of team, always trying to put liver disease onto the sort of societal and a sort of uh, healthcare environment as a major issue. And really HCC is kind of where the, the kind of rubber hits the road in liver disease. Yeah. Do you think the data from your original presentation, do you think that data is improving or the capturing or the diagnosis is improving in the time you've been involved and interested with your consortium, Lewis? I think actually, if we look back over, I would say, you know, the last 10 to 15 years, we've made substantial progress um, with um, the, the general medical community um, within our countries. I think we're making increasing progress with ministries of health. I think it's been really transformative, you know, having the a president of Egypt be president of the Africa Union was was really um, helpful um, because of you know the efforts within Egypt and the ability to make that um, I think to bring that to the awareness of other na other national leaders across the continent. I think it's 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 remarkable you know ten or fifteen years ago we had substantial difficulty for example con convincing the Clinton Health Access Initiative that hepatitis was something that they should have a focus on. And we now have programs that are being led by the Clinton Health Access Initiative to collaborate with our countries to address um, hepatitis C in Africa, for example. So I, I think we've made a lot of progress, um, but we still have a long way to go um, to, to, okay. reach, to reach care for individual patients. Okay, I'm gonna keep us moving on because there are questions I want to come to. So this will go to the time that is allotted. So um, a very nice question from one of our attendees, BC, who I remember meeting um, in one of our meetings, really saying, uh, again, this, this incessant neglect of liver diseases and obviously now 
with other viruses such as COVID-19. So just a shout out for the next uh, session, which I think will be very interesting uh, on COVID and liver disease. How do we put um, sort of liver disease and liver viruses that are driving in this environment, um, med uh, morbidity and mortality, a little bit more on the agenda. Um, my only comment uh, is number one, I think we're not very good at surveillance everywhere. It's not just in Africa. I think there's data I've seen from the US, Lewis, that is that, you know, generic providers of gastroenterology are actually quite poor. And so we even sometimes even in the area of Kings, uh, but likewise, how this, you know, in this continued concern of how do we put pressure on governments and healthcare providers and to try and have this earlier diagnosis. So the reason I wanted to talk about kind of the higher end options was really to draw a line under them and push them away. So a couple of questions about coffee. Um, that I think uh, some of our attendees just wanted some more clarity about the coffee consumption comment you made, Lewis. And then there are some other nice questions coming through. And I'm desperately trying to find the question that came from Jeff Dushaker as well. So over to you, Lewis, and then I'm going to come back to my other panelists. I think just very briefly on the coffee, you know, there's now a fairly substantial amount of epidemiologic evidence that suggests that um, coffee is preventive for chronic liver disease broadly um, and um, reduces progression of, of chronic liver disease. And um, I think it's to the point where for the first time we actually have the European Association for the Study of Liver Disease that has actually, has actually included in its guideline for HCC a recommendation that people with chronic liver disease should use coffee. Um, the recommendation is basically for a minimum of two cups a day. Um, and that, that appears to have very strong epidemiologic evidence for efficacy in, in reducing progression of chronic liver disease. I don't think that gets us away from all the other things we need to do to reduce the risks of, of, um, of chronic liver disease. You don't want to continue alcohol use and, and be drinking coffee and think that will help, for example. So, so Lewis, you're psychic because I just wanted to then again, uh, just for our attendees, just to really highlight the other comorbidities that need to be addressed, that coffee is not going to help us overcome those. And certainly I wanted to come back to uh, Ashraf from his perspective. You know, the, the obesity issue in Egypt is a very significant issue. Do you think that's now continuing to drive and build um, the kind of the, the sort of um, burden of HCC that you're seeing, um, certainly, you know, colleagues such as uh, European colleagues uh, and colleagues at King's, you know, most of what we see now is starting to move, even though there's quite a big proportion still of viral hepatitis, we're seeing more and more NASH related HCC. Is this, is what you, is this what you're seeing in your practice? Yes, thank you very much for this question. Actually, after the, the, the control of the, the problem of hepatitis, and hepatitis carcinoma in our country. By now, it's the up, the upcoming danger is the uh, obesity, Nafield and Nash. We are now seeing, uh, of, of course, the over the obesity and Nafield are a major one of the major problem health problem in our country, and we start to see to see a lot of liver cancer on top of Nafield and Nash. Uh, uh, I think there will be a shift. Uh, 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 from the hepatitis risk factor in the coming few years uh, from uh, hepatitis B and or C as risk factors of hepatitis carcinoma to uh, and Nadeld and NASH as a risk, a major risk factor of hepatitis carcinoma in our country and in other countries uh, uh, also in, in North Africa and maybe in Europe and in, uh, in the States as well. So by now, we, we start to, uh, after finishing screening patients of hepatitis carcinoma, we shift screening for hypertension and overweight for all populations. And patients proven to have an overweight problem, we've start a diet, consult a dietitian, and so on. Great. I want to come back to Edith just again. I apologize for firing off questions. There are a great many questions coming that I'm going to kind of focus on. Edith, do you see any patients with HCC in your practice that don't have hepatitis B, that have, say, alcohol or NASH, or is it just only as comorbidities that you're seeing your HCC population? 
you know, we, we see patients with hepatitis B, and hepatitis C, alcohol, but in most cases, even the, our patients who have hepatitis B, have a, we have a major alcohol issue as well. So um, most patients, they are, you know, they are comorbidities. Well, in the area of, um, um, you know, uh, uh, NAPL and all that, NAPL D, we're beginning to look in that direction because um, obesity is slowly showing up and there's um, it, it really an epidemic of type two diabetes. So we're beginning to look in that direction. And the expectation is that we, if we, that patients will begin to see patients that will come in, uh, that will present from that. But that's not a problem at the moment. So now our major uh, cases are hep B, but we also have um, B, C co-infection, C, and then uh, alcohol. Alcohol is also quite important. Okay, can I come back to Lewis because we've got some questions there. You're being very brilliant as panelists. Um, there was a question that came in about, and I can help you um, if and it'd be a good discussion, is really now refocusing on the different genotypes of hepatitis B. Um, do you think we've really teased out the understanding of the different preponderances of hepatitis B genotypes that are more predominant in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly from the data you've shown, in comparison to say Pan-Pacific Asia with the different genotypes that we see that are predominantly you know, A and B? Do you, I'm, I'm, I'm still unhappy about the lack of data that really pulls us in because I noticed you still talked about aflatoxin, which to me is, is maybe a touch more historical from the, from the data than it is in reality. Do you, what are your comments about this area? No, I think that there's a lot to be learned still um, for us to really gain, gain a complete grasp of what we are facing. And um, I think uh, much of what we do is based on data from Asia. And um, it's important that we um, figure out ways to collaborate to, to improve our understanding of what's happening in Africa. So um, in Western Africa, for example, and in some parts of Central, sort of, sort of Western parts of Central Africa, we have this preponderance of, of genotype E, for example. And um, there's questions related to um, what the um, risk is um, and how much um, genotype E contributes to this risk of the early onset of hepatocellular carcinoma. There's um, some suggestions that um, genotype E perhaps um, is more easily transmitted um, horizontally as well. And, um, and that some of um, what we see in, um, in, in terms of um, transmission after birth is related um, to genotype as well. Um, Dr. Cram, uh, Professor Kramvis uh, mentioned yesterday, for example, the importance of genotype A1 and the fact that in, in Southern Africa and along the East Coast of Africa, we see um, A1 also um, contributing to transmission at relatively low viral loads. And so there's, I think, a, a lot to be learned um, still. Um, and I think the other thing is figuring out how we determine who should be treated for hepatitis B in order to reduce HCC. You're truly psychic. That was my next area I was going into. So lots of questions and I'm still waiting for some questions from Wendy Spearman here. Um, so I really want to go back and we've clearly kicked the tires of this uh, over the last couple of days. How do we you know, specifically um, improve testing for hepatitis B as a point of contact. This is something that Jeff and I have discussed on numerous occasions with other colleagues. How do you think we can step up with regard to point of care or early testing for fibrosis to identify those who have cirrhosis? And, um, and then obviously it's the WHO recommendations to try and increase the use of nuke therapy, which we clearly know um, is very effective in decreasing but not abrogating the risk of HCC development in hepatitis B alone. Um, what are your thoughts around those horribly large questions? Um, um, can I come to Edith first of all? How do you feel we should really do this? We've talked a lot about this at the Calder meetings over the last two years. 
Well, uh, what I, I, we propose to do is to improve screening. It's to, okay. it, it, because if we can improve screening and be able to make, you know, to test and confirm that these patients have some fibrosis and institute treatment early enough, then we will definitely get somewhere. But so the major thing is to get to the people. How do we find them? I, so I think uh, community screening, you know, making sure that, because in many places, what is now done is that you make sure you put, put in screening and then um, um, antenatal clinics in schools, in you know even during campaigns go to the marketplaces and then churches mosques and things so once uh, we are able to improve screening and get the patients to to um to a point where we can now make the diagnosis and, and make an um, institute treatment it will definitely improve the the numbers so I let me ask let me ask another question uh, and this is again for you because you know I, I work in south london it's sunny it's saturday um but i also still see and we need to be very clear about this i still we see every four months or so uh, again stereotypically a young male uh, patient from uh, sub-saharan africa originally who presents with very aggressive hcc um in that age of 35 to 45 so and again those patients don't know their diagnosis of presenting with that diagnosis so this is not a, this is not an issue that's you know just predominant to, to you know this constituency how how do you think education around other viruses apart from hiv is changing um to benefit the populations to help that screening or is it still stuck still really traditionally stuck with H hiv well yes yeah it's still majorly hiv but what we are now doing is to make sure we attach the screening for hbv and now hcv to all hiv screening centers because now that we we it is clear that every nook and corner has centers for screening for HIV. And then if things can happen in such a way that the screening for HBV, HCV will also be offered free, just like HIV, it will improve the outcome. So that is what I... Okay, I feel very bad because I've got some, some very important questions that I'm cutting you off for. We've only got uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, I need to still cover a couple of areas. So Wendy, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, it's talking about access to ultrasounds in the community and the role of centralized reporting, but obviously also the idea of point of care testing. Again, we talked about for hep B, HCV and fibrosis assessment. And the suggestion from Wendy that an APRI score of greater than two seems to under underestimate cirrhosis and I didn't and, and I think this comes back to uh, a very sensible comment and I think Lewis made this comment right from the bat which is really the mission statement of this meeting which is really putting liver disease um, in Africa on the agenda at all levels so so John is asking well with early onset of HCC and I don't think we've teased out the drivers of that early onset or higher risk um, do we think or should we just discard um, the recommendations from ASLD, easel, apazel. Be very careful because I was one of the panelists for the easel recommendations. So uh, what do you think? Because I don't think they serve um, uh, African patients uh, and this discussion well in my book. Can I come to you, Professor Ashraf, first of all on that? Horrible question. Uh, actually, uh, I, I need to, 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 to focus your question, please, again if you don't mind. Do you think the guidance, uh, do you think guidance that is not generated from uh, populations that are either Egyptian or Sub-Saharan Africa is really relevant uh, in any setting, whether it's surveillance or, let, or for this discussion, HPV treatment initiation? Do you think, you know, the push is really, we have to have our own guidelines. We have to generate the data. What do yes. you feel about that? This is a crucial question, actually. And the, 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 the main obstacle for putting any uh, 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 um, uh, acceptable guidelines is the availability of meta-analysis and the availability of valid data. This is the, the, the point. In our country, uh, unfortunately, we, uh, the data, the meta-analysis, the data is not so much available. So uh, what we are now 
uh, doing in our country is to improve uh, the, the, the international publication, to improve the high quality uh, data so as we can use it for putting the guidelines in the field of hepatitis B, hepatic carcinoma, and other uh, major uh, health problem in our country. And I'm going to cut you off there because we're running out of time. Edith, do you have a comment about my horrible question about essentially easel uh, and ASLD guidance may not serve the constituency and the patient populations that we have? When, if we get to a world where our point of care testing is better, um, should we not just be much more aggressive about initiating therapy given the risks and the, the dynamic that we see in, in, in your practice? Yes. I, I one one thing I have to say is that uh, we have actually like seen that our patients develop um, um, develop um, HCC at with very low viral loads. So uh, I think we we cannot uh, it does not serve us very well. Like the uh, the guidelines that are given for treatment for for um, um, HPV and HCV. So we need to attack our patients earlier. And then the screening too, from, from the data shown that our patients present um, um, about um, a decade, uh, they, they present with HCC a decade earlier than other people. So uh, the screening for Africans should actually, uh, we've shown from the data that uh, Professor Lewis uh, showed, it was shown that if we can drop the age to about 30, 40, over 70% of the, uh, the cancer patients will be, will be picked up early enough for treatment, uh, early enough for something to be done. So treatment for uh, our own standards for treating uh, the uh, HB, uh, hepatitis B should be, the, the viral load should be lower because our patients present, uh, um, developed cancer at very low viral loads and the screening should also come lower. Lewis, can I come to you on the thorny issue of guidance and obviously data um, and, and really, you know, are the, you know, when there is no data or less data in the populations that are actually providing them the significant morbidity and mortality globally, how do we influence those guideline presenters? And before you answer, I just would highlight, we, we're talking about hepatitis B a lot, but it was very interesting to see, um, and it's embarrassing that you know we, my team presented with Jeff um, in hepatitis C, the rarer subtypes of hepatitis C, the DAA therapy was, was less successful. And we really wanted to make that really a political comment to say that trials need to happen in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Egypt, in all of Africa, because this is where um, hepatitis B is a big issue, and we're trying to push that agenda very much when we talk about hepatitis B new therapies. That's an aspiration. But, but what are your comments on this discussion that we're having, uh, Lewis? Yes, so I, th I think, you know, it's somewhat controversial. I think it's important for us to, I, to develop more evidence. Um, I think there's a number of trials, for example, that would be um, important to do. One approach, for example, might be, as Edith suggested, dropping the threshold for treatment to, let's say, 200 international units, you know, and, and saying, okay, what if we did a comparative study of current guideline care at 2,000 international units um, versus, um, versus a cohort that we, that we treated at, at, at 200 international units? Um, of course, you know, that doesn't take away the fact that we have difficulty with doing viral loads across the board, but we have to start somewhere. And I think developing um, cooperative groups to, to try to address these questions in a system systematic way is important. The other question that's maybe even further out there is the whole test and treat, you know, treat everyone who's surface antigen positive. Um, and that maybe is even more controversial, but um, even having some pilots um, that um, were testing these different modalities, I think would be important to help us um, get to, you know, to improved evidence-based um, guidelines. 
Okay, last couple of questions uh, or comments from you. Thank you so much. It's been a really enjoyable session. Um, I've really enjoyed contributing to this, but really listening to your expertise. So um, one final question for me and then final comments from each of you. So from my colleague, Jeff, who's really great, just generally, um, so few ex advances and we're still talking about, you know, vaccination as prevention and initiation of therapy. How, it's a horrible question, Jeff, how can we uh, hook governments and NGOs uh, to try and get this test and treat or, or point of care testing, um, number one? I think this is an impossible question to answer, but in, in, in 30 seconds each of you, what do you think about that comment? And if you have any final comments, uh, just generally from our session, which has been really enjoyable. I'll come to you, uh, Edith, first, if I may. You're muted. <laughs> you did so well. We all did so well. What, what's the government? Um, it's so, I just don't know what we'll do to get the government to be in the driver's seat for, for this, you know? Um, when we were last in Egypt, last call, we were listening to, to them and um, trying to learn what they, how they did it in Egypt, that it became a government issue. So what we, uh, is advocacy, you know, the, uh, it's just for us to move on and see how to convince the government, Ministry of Health and the NGOs, to come in and help so that even if this, if we can move from the tertiary hospitals to the secondary, even the uh, local government hospitals, if treatment can, if the, the point of care testing can go near down to, and people should be um, trained to record, to, you know, recognize those patients and send them on and attach them to treatment, things will definitely do better. Be better. Okay, so, okay we're going to go very quickly. We've got one minute left, and I want to give the last word to not me, Lewis. Um, so, uh, Professor Ashraf, any co other comments about um, this big discussion about improving yes, uh, access very quickly? Just in 10 minutes, in 10 seconds. Seconds. Uh, yes, vaccination is already a, pro a, a program, vaccination for hepatitis B is already a program in our country. And for the hepatitis C virus, we are now, there is a big project helping other, country, other African countries having the problem of hepatitis C. Uh, the, we are providing the hepatitis C virus treatment for free for uh, other uh, African countries. So firstly, I just need to thank you all. I need to thank uh, the attendees for really good questions. Just ticking off the comments. So number one, obviously we shouldn't forget the different trajectory in HIV co-infected with Hep B. We haven't really picked that up as much as maybe we should have done. Very nice comment from Alexander Stocktail about maybe a lower APRI for initiation of therapy, which we all agree with. Last 30 seconds, uh, an overall comment to you, sir. Lewis, it's been really great. Any take home messages for our audience and attendees? I think for the long term, really pushing the birth dose of hepatitis B vaccine. For the near term, thinking about hepatitis as part of a strategy for non-communicable diseases for our countries. So we need to integrate hepatitis and liver cancer care into broader strategies for non-communicable diseases and what we would call chronic diseases in all our countries. Thank you very much.